Let's turn over to Romans 8, if you would. That song was written by a man I know, or knew. He's with the Lord now, Frank Garlock. And... Uh, A great musician. He was. If you wonder what I'm looking for, I'm looking for my Bible. I had everything organized except my Bible. You forgive me. I know where it is. I have the paper there written out for you with all the verses but I just don't feel comfortable preaching without my Bible. I got to have it. <laughs> I just got to have it. Romans 8, 28, you've got it there. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Father, I ask you to help us now. Much has happened in this service. and I really praise the Lord for that report about the, about the fair. And Lord, you know that the pastor's not here. Things are out of pocket a little bit. But Lord, I pray you'd help us settle into the Word of God now. We ask you to speak to us and help this poor preacher. A dying man preaching to dying men. Help, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. These verses are part of a context that discusses suffering. We see in verse 18, which is on your paper, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Well, well the suffering of this present time, that's for certain. And Mike, I want to title this message, Make Sense of the Mess We Are In. I always try to do that so he knows what to title the message. Uh, if somebody wants a copy, he'll probably make a CD for you or do something to help you with it. I think he also puts them online sometimes. But isn't that a good promise? Yeah, thank God. Sometimes life gets so tough. But to think, it's, it's li I always liken it to a lady having a baby. I mean, I've heard them scream. I've heard them moan and groan and cry and all kinds of things. But when that baby's born, it just seems like instantly it's just all forgotten. And wow, look at the baby. Look at the baby. And I kind of feel like that's the way life is for us. We're going to moan and groan and go through tough times in this life. But once we step on shore, step, once we step into heaven, ah, we'll just forget it all probably. It's going to be so glorious and so wonderful. It's a great promise. Promise of something better. Yeah, better than what this old creation is. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth together until now. That's not a fun verse. That isn't. The groaning of the creature, Romans 8.23. And I'm going right through this list, so you should be able to just read them with me, and that helps me to preach faster. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, or namely, the redemption of the body. 
And uh, the older you get, I'm 71, the older you get, the more you groan. <laughs> yeah. I was getting out of a chair, and I go, oh, my wife said, what What'd you say? I said, not that I'm just groaning. <laughs> just groaning. Yeah. But we groan for something. I mean, we long for something. And that's for the redemption of the body. That's one of the great, wonderful doctrines of the Bible is that somebody who's saved, when the Lord comes back or when we die, uh, we get a new body, and uh, it's perfect. No pain, no suffering. And uh, that's awesome. But Christians are in quite a mess. The Apostle Paul said in Philippians 1.23, For I am in a strait. Uh, he's in a, in a bind here. He's... he's He's, he's conflicted. I'm in a confliction between two, two things. Having a desire to depart, that means, and to be with Christ, that means to go to heaven, which is far better. He said, I, I, I'm in a confliction. I didn't put the other verse down there, but the other verse is uh, that you know, he wants to stay with them and minister to them. So he's in a, he said, I'd love, I just, man, I'm ready to go to heaven. And, but he said, it's need, I want to stay here. It's needful for me to help you. And uh, that's a, that's an important thing. And so he didn't, ha he didn't say he came to the conclusion, but he did say it was better for him to go to heaven but yet the need was still there. And there, there we are. We're in, our citizenship's in heaven, but we're stranded here on earth. Yeah. We sure are. And uh, we just don't know how much longer we'll be stranded. This isn't our home as a Christian. We must dwell here for a while. We're strangers and pilgrims down here. Think of that. We're strangers. I, I'm going to tell you, they used to say that the church was following the world. That the world got a little worse and the church was getting a little worse. The world get worse, church would get worse. But I'm going to tell you, right now in this country, the world has just went into a sprint and uh, there are churches that are following, but they can't keep up with the wickedness that's going on right now. Mm -hmm. And that's the truth. Uh, it's becoming more and more obvious that Satan's behind more and more things. That he's been behind all along. He's just expo being exposed now. And so here we are in this old world, strangers and pilgrims. We don't exactly, Christians don't exactly fit in anywhere. We don't fit in. If you're working at a place and they have a party, well, it just you just don't fit in a lot of times. If the community has an event, well, unless you have a booth out there winning people to Jesus, uh, you don't fit in. You don't fit in. None of our people went out to the fair to hear the live music. I know that's so. You just don't fit in. And that's the way Christians are. And uh, it's just the way it is. And that's the way I want it, to tell you the truth. This is, this is different. So we see the positiveness of this verse in Romans 8.28. And we know, we know some things. We know something. The Bible talks about knowing some things. You know, when Charles Darwin wrote his book about evolution, do you know that in, for 800 times he wrote, we suppose. We suppose this is so, so this must be so. Thank God. 
He didn't write the book of, of we suppose. He wrote the book of we know. Amen. We know whom we have believed. God. And uh, thank God for that. Psalm 4610. It's on your paper. And did somebody come in and I get a paper? Everybody got a paper? Okay, just find 4610, Psalm 4610. Be still and know that I am God, and I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Yeah. Praise the Lord. We see the God of the Bible. We got to take the Bible by faith, but we can do that. Because of the Word of God. The Word of God is more up-to-date than the local newspaper is. It really is. Paul knew something in 2 Timothy 1.12. For the which also I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know, that's the song he sang. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Sometime you ought to just take that verse and break it down and study that thing. Apostle Paul said, I know something here, and I'm persuaded it's so. He's convinced it's so. John knew something in 1 John 5, 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. You can know you have eternal life. That's why we can go out to the fair and tell those folks, you know what? Listen to me. Please listen to me because I can show you a way that you can know that you have eternal life. Amen. Know it. You know, most churches don't do that. Most churches don't do that. You've got to work your way or appease God in some way. And... Uh, but no, the Bible says you can know. Once it's settled and you have eternal life, it's settled, it's done, it's over. You've done conquered that problem, or God conquered it for you. And praise God, John knew, he knew that he had eternal life. We can too. You and I can know John, 1 John 5, 13. And... Uh, yeah, we can know that too. John knew he was saved, and why can't we know he was saved? If Paul knew, then we can know. But there's some things we don't know. <laughs> One, we, we don't know what to pray for all, all the time. And I'm telling you, that's the truth. I've, I, I'm, I'm taking care about how I pray. I do. I don't think you ought to be haphazard. If you're a Christian, God listens to you. And you better not be haphazard in your prayer. When you pray for someone, you be pretty specific. You, t you tell God what you'd like to see, and you better make sure it's right. You know, the kids around here say that they'd like to pray for snow in the winter, you know. And, and that's cool. That's all fun. But I always stop them and say, you know, let's pray for snow, but let's also pray nobody will get hurt by the snow. And we got to be responsible for how we pray. We really do. And sometimes those prayers that we make for someone is not what God wants for them. And uh, sometimes those prayers we make for ourselves are not what... So we don't always know. In uh, Romans 8.26, we lack, sometimes we just lack wisdom. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, our weakness, our, you know, our lack of ability. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. You know, <laughs> I don't know what God's language is, but I don't know it. What language does the Holy Spirit talk to God with? I don't know. I'm not privy to that. But sometimes I don't know 
what to pray for right. I don't. And uh, in a lot of ways. But I can pray. And I'll pray to the best of my ability, but sometimes the Holy Spirit just, you know, says, hey, let me step in here and pray for you and make intercession for you. And he does it in a language I don't know. He does it in God's, I don't know that language. Maybe I'll be taught that in heaven. I don't know. Sometimes we don't know what to pray for. Sometimes we don't know. Well, all the time we don't know when the coming of the Lord is. We just don't know. It says in Acts 1-7, and, and he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. So the Lord said, You don't know the signs, times or the seasons? You know, with all this Israel and the attack on Israel and all of this stuff, I mean, the Internet is just full of people trying to tell what the prophecy is. But let me just say this to you. And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons, okay? So don't, let me just advise you, don't try. You don't know why they attacked Israel, and I don't either. God does. God knows it all. And he, and he goes on, which the Father hath put in his own power. It's all in God's hands. It's all in his power. We don't know. We might not always know what the will of God is for us from day to day. I believe God wants us to know. I believe he desires us to know. I think he's going to show us if we earnestly and, and righteously pray for the will of God. But sometimes we don't know yet. And we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I've had some strange days that came forth. Uh, you don't know. I remember the morning that uh, I was sick. And I knew I was in trouble. I cried out to God. I, I literally cried out to God. Uh, not, not prayed. I cried. Oh, God. I was wailing. Oh, God. I don't know what I'm facing, but I need your help. Please spare me. Help me. And I was crying out to God. And within just a few minutes, my, my temperature shot to 105. And uh, my wife called an ambulance. And uh, they took me to the hospital. And for seven days, I was in a coma. And they told my wife to call the family in on the, the first day I got to uh, uh, Vidant up in uh, Greenville. They said, call the family and he's not going to live. But I believe God heard my prayer. I do. But we don't know what a day is going to bring forth. Do you? What's going to happen to you tomorrow? Who knows? That's why we need to trust God today. That's for sure. We don't, may not know why certain things happen. I think it's okay to ask God why, but it's not okay to demand an answer because sometimes he's not going to tell you why. And I'll tell you why he won't tell you why because it's above your pay grade. That's why. Totally above your pay grade. That's a, that's a military government expression. Boast not thyselves of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day brings forth. The lost man knows not the things of God, if somebody's not saved. But a natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. The things of God are spiritually discerned. If the Holy Spirit don't dwell you in you, you're not going to spiritually discern anything. There's some things we know in part. 
1 Corinthians 13, 12, for, we, for now we see through a glass darkly. Isn't that the truth? But then face to face, now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. We see through a glass darkly. Do you know that we have a ministry of propaganda in the United States? Their only, their only mission is to put out propaganda in the United States, not the world, to us. You know, I have gotten to the point where if I watch mainstream news, if they say something is so, I'll automatically say, well, that can't be so. And when I catch myself finding that they are in a certain vein and everybody's agreeing on something in the media and it looks like it could be so, then I start thinking, I don't believe them. What's going on here? Something else is going on. What is going on? We know in part. We look through a glass darkly. I tell you, that's why this book right here is the most important that possession that a Christian has. And the reason why this book is so important is because it's the only place you can go and be guaranteed that you're reading the truth. Yeah. I don't care who it is. People may not just know what's going on, and yet they're acting like they do. Some people are out there just deceiving us. You know? It's like somebody said something to somebody, and he said, where did you get that information? He said, oh, I got it off the Internet. And they say, do you believe everything you hear off the Internet? <laughs> like, no. No, no, a lot of good things, I know, but boy, there's a lot of wacky stuff. We see through a glass darkly. We know in part. We know in part. That's why this is I just so important. i got to move on. There's much that you and I do not know. Because to live the Christian life, one, requires faith. Mark eleven twenty two, and Jesus answered, answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. Yeah. That's what Jesus said. In fact, unlike the Old Testament, the New Testament talks a lot about having faith. Jesus himself talked a lot about having faith. You know, Paul said, Whatsoever is not a faith is sin. Yeah, so we walk by faith. We know there's a heaven because of faith. We know there's a hell because of faith. We know that this book is the word of God because of faith. You put that on the bookshelf at the library. It's not the same as the other books. This is the word of God. We know it by faith. Yeah, so we walk by faith and not by sight. The Bible says... To live the Christian life requires trusting in God. Isaiah 12, 2, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust. I will not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. I'm going to just trust in God. Trust in Him. That was a big revelation to me after I had open heart surgery. I was in the room recovering. And uh, the medicine was so heavy and thick, and I was in a brain fog like you couldn't believe. And, it, and, and about the second day into recovery, things started dawning on me, and I realized the situation I was in and the pain and all of this. And then I dawned on me, hey, I'm a Christian! <laughs> I'd forgotten. I'm a Christian. You know what the second thought is? God, I trust you. I don't know what I'm facing. I don't know what's happening, but I trust you. 
And what a comfort that was to me. What a comfort. To, to live the Christian life just means you got to trust God. If you're in a business as a Christian of trusting your own abilities, I say this with great specificity. Good luck. Because <laughs> that's about all you're going to rely on is some, is some luck. You're not going to rely on the Lord. You trust God. To live the Christian life requires patience. For which cause we, in 2 Corinthians 4.16, for which cause we faint not, but through our outward, though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. I wish I was perfect. I wish you were perfect. Somebody said, if you're looking for a church and you find a perfect church, please don't join it. It won't be perfect anymore, right? That's about the truth. I wish I was perfect, but I'm not. Wish you were perfect, but you're not. And so we need to have patience. We have to have patience with others, patience with ourselves, patience with our family, patience. And to know that all these situations that arise, we can uh, give them to the Lord. First uh, Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. What a blessing that God cares for us. To live the Christian life requires Bible study. Bible study. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. A Bible study. I would uh, get after Bible study. One of the things that happened to me after my open heart surgery, and then uh, a few months later, uh, I was put in the hospital for sepsis and nearly died. Um, one of the things I did, so I just sat, I did, all I had to do all day is just sit there and try to recover. And so I thought, well, you know, we, we talked about doing a study on uh, the comfort verses in the Bible. And I never intended to write a book. I just wanted to study start in Genesis and study through it and glean the comfort verses in the Bible. And uh, that's, that's basically how that whole thing started. It wasn't until much later that I thought, well, you know, this might be a good book, <laughs> you know? And uh, yeah, so, um, we worked on that, but it was a Bible study. It was, I give the, give the book away sometimes to some preacher or something, and I'll tell them, look, you, you take this book with a grain of salt because some of it was written while I was on oxycodone, okay? <laughs> and I'm telling you the truth, it was. <laughs> I'm not lying. But uh, I did go back and check my work when I wasn't, so I, it, it turned out okay. But study your Bible. There's so much in it. You'll never exhaust it, ever. There's, I keep thinking of books I'd like to write. I wish I could live to 200, man. I might write a bunch of books, but... Uh, yeah. We need to be in the, in the word. Number two, the people of the verse. Them that love God. That's who it's, that's who it's talking about. Romans 8, 28. For we know that, uh, well, what's it say? And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Let me just say, it's to people who love God. It's to Christians who love God. Christians, 
Born again Christians. Do you know, I hate to burst your bubble, but there are born again Christians who don't love God. Amen. Yeah, amen. That's the truth. Apostle Paul got so frustrated and God used him to write the, the word of God. And he said, for anybody who loveth not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema maranatha. Anathema, that's a transliteration from the Greek. Anathema means let him be accursed. Maranatha means the Lord is coming. Apostle Paul said, if somebody says they're a Christian and they don't love Jesus, just let them go be accursed. Because they are, and they will be. And if they're truly saved, there's chastisement coming to them. You know? And the Apostle Paul said, I'm not going to get my gun and go after them. That's not what I do. He said, but I'm just going to let them go. The Lord's coming back. He'll straighten it all out. He'll straighten it all out. He surely will. And that's good to know. It is. It's to them who love God. This verse isn't for somebody who doesn't love God. This is the verse to somebody who loves God, who loves him. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy mind and all thy body. Yeah, I'm jumping ahead. Matthew 22, 37. With all your heart you love the Lord. Proverbs 4, 23 Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Your love for God comes out of your heart, and you better keep it, tend it. Make sure your heart's proper before God. Jeremiah said, my heart's deceitful above every, all things and desperately wicked, and who can know it? Well, God knows it, you know, but that doesn't mean only bad things come out of your heart. We're to love the Lord thy God with all your heart. That's everything. That's everything. So Romans 8, 28's promise, the promise of it is to those who love God. Jesus said, if you love me, in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Does it matter what God says? Man, if you're the Christian who walks out of this place and say, well, I don't care what the Bible says. I don't care what God says. I'm going to do this. You don't love God. Amen. I'm telling you, I've heard it. I have heard it. You can't qualify what God says. If you love God, keep his commandments. Amen. I didn't say it. I'm just the messenger. Jesus said it himself. It's in the red in your Bible if you have a red letter edition. If you love me, keep my commandments. So love goes deep. And I believe it's because God's love goes deep. I believe God created this whole world and universe out of love. Amen. I do. I do, and I believe God created Adam and Eve with the capacity to love. And I believe that God set this whole world up so that he could love Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve could love God. But I've already preached this in another message, but look, love has to be voluntary. It has to be voluntary. You have to love Willingly. I mean, I'm pretty sure Brother Frank didn't take a 38 pistol over to Crystal's house when he was wanting to ask her to marry him, take the gun out, cock it, and say, Listen, you got to love me, and you're going to marry me. And I have a feeling if he had done that, love and marriage would have been the last thing on her mind right then. You don't force 
love. Love has to be voluntary. And God created all of this so that he could love people and people could love him. And when a Christian won't love God the way he should, it violates the very nature of God and what he wants to happen. I'm going to tell you, I've heard it over and over, that the, the highest thing that we are Christians to do is to glorify God. No, no, they asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? He said, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy mind and all thy body. Does that leave anything out? Not a bit. So it's to those who love him. Love matters to God a great deal. And that's why in eternity, Psalm 1611 uh, says that there's going to be pleasures forevermore. It says, in, 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 and Paul wrote, he said that there will be trophies of God's grace all through all eternity. God's just going to love on us through all eternity. And guess what? We're going to love him back. Because God is love. Woo! I got to go. The process of the verse. All things work together for good to them who love God. That's what the essence of the verse is talking about. All things work together for good to them that love God. All things include pleasant things and unpleasant things. It includes downright hurtful things. But in 1 Corinthians 3, 9, it says, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. God, for the Christian, God is the farmer, and you're the farm. Think of that. I grew up on a farm. I know what it is to tend the farm. Takes a lot of work, a lot of work to do. And that's what the husbandry is as a farmer. You're God's farm. You're God's husbandry. He's the farmer. You're the farm. He's tending to you. He's doing everything every day to help you every day. It says here that you're God's building. This building just didn't, you know, happen in a hurricane and it just got all thrown together. Somebody had to build the thing. And it was a process and a lot of work to put this building together. And that's exactly what this verse is talking about for the Christian, that God is putting your life together. That's why in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, it talks about uh, no man can lay on any other foundation but Jesus. I know that didn't sound Amen. right, but that's the way it is. You can't build on any other foundation but Jesus. And he's trying to build into our lives. So all things, all things, does any detail escape God? No. No. Not to the God who created Adam's. <laughs> what can escape God? You know, how many, they say, well, how many angels are on the head of a pin? Man, I, who would know? I don't think, you know, any. <laughs> One, maybe. But that's not the question. How many atoms are there? Does God know the atoms? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I, I can't go any further in that way because it's just too quick to get over my head. But God knows everything, and God knows everything intimately, and he knows us intimately more than we could possibly imagine. And God is about the business of orchestrating things in our life. We're, co -la we're laborers together with God, and he is building us and, and, and working in us. 
The purpose of his verse is to be conformed to his image. Verse 29, for, we, for whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Not, don't worry about predestinate. It tells you what you're predestinated to. You're saved, you get saved, you're predestinated to be conformed to the image of his Son. So that when you're walking around on earth, what God wants is so that you are living just like Jesus would live. You're conformed to his image. Yeah, that takes some work and time and maturity and, and that, but that's where we should be heading. All things work together for good. Why? So that we can be conformed to his son. 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. For we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. We shall be like him. Did you get it? We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We're going to be like Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15, 52, 53. In a moment in the twinkling of eye at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised into corruptible, and we shall be changed. What are we going to be changed to? For this corruptible shall put on incorruption. Well, that'll be something new. And this mortal shall put on immortality. We're going to be like Jesus. We're corruptible now, but then we're not going to be corruptible. No sin. Woo! We're mortal now. We can die. We can get sick. My wife's sick at home. Yeah, we can do that. But then, no, we're incorruptible. Those viruses won't have any way to get to us. We're incorruptible. Amen. Hallelujah. And it's predestined to be so. Not salvation, but to be conformed to the image. We're predestined to be conformed. Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians 3, 21, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his, who? Jesus. Jesus' glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things to himself. We're going to be changed like uh, into the image of his son, but right now, on planet Earth, right now in your Christian life, all things are working together for good to them that love God so that you can be conformed to the image of his son. Ooh, that's deep, deep, deep. Amen. Things don't happen by happenstance. Not to the Christian. You don't have a car accident. I don't believe. Man, I've been in enough of them. And I've seen God work this and work this and work this and then this and then an accident comes. And I'll look back and say, look, you know, the Lord worked here and 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 then the accident happened and it happened just an amazing way. And, you know, I've even, some of the best cars I ever had came through an accident. They told my car and the insurance pays, you know, the money, and I go buy another car. Lord said, yeah, I want you to have another car. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy. I know I'm talking crazy. But all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Some say great persecution's coming to the church. I believe it is. I really do. Unless something changes, I believe persecution's coming. I don't have time today to get into it. But the Apostle Paul stated this, and I'm closing. Philippians 3, 8-10, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss 
for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, that I may win Christ. Whatever came, man, he some of the, the hardest things you could possibly have. He was whipped with a cat of nine tails 39 times. Several times. He was left for dead, beaten and left for dead, stoned one time. I mean, these guys, grown men taking rocks and, and leveling them at him and, and leaving him for dead. And somehow God raised him up from that. Shipwrecks. And he's doing all that to get the gospel to people. And be found in him not having my own righteousness, because we don't have any righteousness, Amen. which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him. You want to know Jesus? That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. You want to know Jesus' power? And the fellowship of his sufferings. Now, this is where I'm careful about praying about certain things. We live in an amazing society in America, but I'll tell you what, if, if some Christians in other countries would have tried what you guys tried, they would be in prison today or dead. And the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Apostle Paul said, well, I want to know him. I want to know him. I want to know his power. I want to know his sufferings. And if I, if I have to, I'm going to do what, I, what God wants me to do. And if it means that I suffer and I'm beaten and stoned or, or whipped nearly to death, okay. And if it means I die, I want to be conformable to Jesus' death. He died for us. He died for righteousness. Now I'm telling you, I'm preaching above my head. But may we all be willing to die for Jesus if, we, if it comes to that. If it comes to that. I just leave one thing with you. This guy, back in the days of great persecution on Christians, people were dying, they were burning them at the stake, Christians, and uh, they were coming after him. He came, they came after this guy, and they said, you either recant, recant about Jesus, or we're going to burn you at the stake. At first they said, he said, well, no, I'm not going to recant about Jesus. And then he did. And he wept and wept and wept. They did not put him on the, at the stake. And he said, I can't help it. I've got to preach about Jesus. And he did. And they came, got him. And said, you're going to recant or we're going to put you on a stake and burn you to death. And he said, I will not recant. They brought him to the stake. He asked them to loosen his hands. And they did. See, he had signed a statement saying he recanted about Christ. And he signed it with his hand. And he said, I want to come to this fire. And the first thing that's going to burn on me is going to be this hand that signed that false statement. And he thrust his hand into the fire first. And then he plunged into the fire. I don't know what we're facing. But I do know this. All things work together for good. 
to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Father, take this message, Lord, and speak to my heart and everyone here. Bless us, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's stand together. And I'm glad you're here, came today. I hope this was a blessing to you. And uh, Brother Frank's going to be preaching that this afternoon. Uh, it starts somewhere around 1.30. Hardly ever starts on 1.30, but, but uh, I want you to hear him. I want you to hear him. Well, we 